let's go ahead and get started. Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Data Science Working Group for August 27th. We are under the Chaos Code of Conduct, like all chaos meetings. So, so please follow it and please be kind to each other. Uh, let's go ahead and get started on some of the agenda items. So the practitioner guide for security. I have been uh, working on that. I've got a draft. Um, the important thing to note is that um, we're never going to cover all things security. So the the hope is that this is these are the things that would help someone get started in making their open source project more secure and then therefore more sustainable over time. So it's it's not comprehensive. It's not all the things. It's it's just here are some things to start with, and here's what you can measure, and here's some improvements that you can make. So um, I am not an expert in security, so I would really love feedback on that. So we won't go through the doc here, but I encourage you to provide some feedback. The deadline for feedback is September 6th, which is right before I come back from, uh, from vacation. So that hopefully, hopefully I'll have some feedback and I can uh, finalize, finalize the document then. Any questions on that? And I am moving things around on the agenda because I just saw a note from Callie that she's running a few minutes late. So I'm going to move that Exodus research down since that's uh, Callie's uh, item. Um, okay, if there's nothing else on the topic of the practitioner guide, um, someone want to provide an update on the event location inclusivity? Um, well, I guess um, we're me, Elizabeth, and Sophia are here. So, um, and I don't know if we have time for this, but maybe um, if we if we if we did, we can talk about. Um, some of the findings we each um, had in interviewing uh, event organizers. Elizabeth and Sophia, what do you think? I think yeah. we definitely we definitely have time for that. Um, yeah, because I'm also going to walk through some of my findings from the uh, forks and relicensing research too. So I think this is a good place to good place to do that. Is there well, something I should click on, or you you just want to talk through it? Um, I think we can just talk through it. We have I, yeah, some I have to find my notes too, um, but I. Um, I can go ahead and get started with just some of the things off the top of my head and we can each go through. So the three of us had been meeting and we were um, thinking of ways in which we could potentially tackle this. And I think we started off with um, first thinking through, well, let's interview some people um, who do events. Um, and so the, the three of us each reached out to a different person um, I talked to Brian Prophet, um, who is organizing um, ASF events, and in talking, when we have a list of questions we asked um, each of the interviewees, but um, in talking to Brian, I think he, for him, I think diversity is top of mind. Um, so. It is, it, I felt like it's, um, and, and that might not always be the case with event organizers, but he did say that is something he thinks of first. Um, and then all of the other logistics and stuff comes come with it. Um, and I have notes for all of this, uh, and I can put the summary uh, some in, in our data science notes as well. Um, but then he said after diversity, then it, you really think of, okay, what location have we, um, haven't we already done or what location can we do given the budget? And then um, it's really, it's really the dates that make it tough. Um, it's not having conflicting dates with other conferences. And then it's um, getting just that, that place and having and being able to schedule that place on as on an exact date is the is one of the toughest things that um, that comes with organizing. Um, he also talked about having tier A cities versus tier B cities, and then thinking through some of the laws that are happening in those locations. Um, but I think the the what I got out of it was that um, if you have someone who thinks of diversity 
it's not going to be perfect but it but it's it's they're trying and they're they're making that um part of the conference um and that doing doing an event inclusivity metric um is useful in that he he and this is what he said was that um other people would be able to find out like find out he he would be able to find out what other organizers are thinking about um and so that's what would be valuable to him but i don't i don't know um how deep into a metric and w what aspects of a metric would be valuable just knowing what other people are thinking of is, is something that he he'd like to see so that's kind of my take with brian um, Elizabeth, do you want to talk about um, what you and Angela had uh, discussed? Yeah, it was a super interesting conversation, and I really appreciate Angela's um, uh, just lever of, a level of candor. She was very honest and open, and I, I really appreciated that. And she has years of experience, and her team does as well. So it was just super interesting to hear her experience. Um, she said cost is the number one thing, the number one driver. Also availability. Um, she said that they are having to book years out, which was never a thing before. So like they're booking for 2028 right now. So it is that one of her challenges then is it's impossible to gauge and to predict anything really about the local landscape, about political landscapes, about laws, you know, so they just do their best. <laughs> Honestly, they're just doing the best that they can and um, genuinely trying to uh, make awesome events. So they focus a lot on the things that they can control and not as much on the things they can't. Um, they also look at places where their communities already exist. So they're trying to serve their folks the best they can um, where, they, where they are, meet them where they are, but also keeping it global and not focusing only on like Silicon Valley or San Francisco. Um, one thing that also is challenging for them uh, was that, um, they so they there's always this hesitance to host a location or host an event in a location that is less than uh inclusive right but at the same time you're leaving those folks out if you avoid those areas so those folks miss out doubly really because nobody wants to come where they are so it's it's <laughs> it's kind of a catch-22 right so it's just something that they struggle with and they try to balance um, you know, at least hosting something for folks that they can get to those events and have an equal opportunity and not be, uh, you know, not be <laughs> even more marginalized than they already are. So um, that's kind of rough. Um, they also said that it's difficult because of the, the uh, disparity between local laws and local culture versus state laws, if they're talking about the US in particular. So the example she gave was uh, Texas. So Texas as a state is like not that inclusive, right? Like it's problematic uh, for, for many people. But that being said, Austin is super inclusive and the laws are very friendly there and the, the culture is very friendly. And um, so it's, you know, again, it's a struggle um, and they just, they just do the best that they can. And I know when they had a, uh, just from personal experience, when they hosted an event in Austin uh, a few years ago, it was right after some law had been passed, I believe, that was um, around, uh, it was very anti-LGBTQ friendly. And um, of course, there was nothing that the LF could do about that. But what they could do was provide support and information and, um, uh, you know, just trying to buffer those folks from what it was going on around outside the conference and they also gave a, a way for um, everybody at the conference to um, to give back so they they set up links to local communities that were trying to support these folks as well so it wasn't just trying to protect the people at the conference which they did their very best and i think they did a pretty good job um, but it's also just trying to make the local environment better for those folks with the resources that they can so I think that I really appreciate the way that they think outside the box on that kind of stuff. Um, they said that the, um, let me look here. 
I, I asked her if, if that they had data around what would help assess the inclusivity of an event, would that impact their site selection? And they said, yes, definitely, because they also have to, even though they cast a wide net, they have to hunt for answers a lot. So having like a database of commonly asked questions and, you know, because all these event organizers are asking the same questions to each of these venues. So just having one place where they could just find that information would be seriously helpful, I think, um, not just for Angela, but even smaller organizers who just don't have the resources to, they don't have a team at their disposal to go and do a lot of research and, and find these answers. Um, they do have a top, a list of top cities, I think similar to what Brian was saying with the tier A, B, C, um, so that they do have some go-tos that they know. Um, oh yeah, the other, uh, sorry, I was just looking at these notes. The other example she gave with regard to um, kind of the city is that like Salt Lake City is very diverse, but mm -hmm. Utah isn't the best <laughs> for some folks. So, you yeah. know, again, Mm -hmm. Like Salt Lake has surprisingly has a huge LGBTQ population. Um, it's a really vibrant community, actually. Um, but I was yeah. going to say the Austin one, even though I, and it was just like more of an example, but just for people that the Austin, the perception of it is from a lot of people very different than what the actuality is. Like it is, it is better in comparison to the state of Texas. But I would say, like, I'm I'm from Texas for context, and how people describe and talk about Austin is a lot more idealistic than what the actual state of those of what it is. Um, which Austin is ain't good. what it used to be. Yeah, I guess it's like it may be. Uh, yeah, it's definitely. <clears throat> so I I'm as a, I don't know what it was like ten years ago because I wouldn't have been aware of of that but yeah it's something that is like pretty heavily talked about people from there and then there's a lot of times whenever now that i live in boston people will move there and be like oh my god and i was like yeah i tried to tell you um <laughs> but like it just being like that but i mean the county is a lot better but what people think it is and this idea of what it is is just it's a lot different <laughs> that's a really good point because you think about like when people are organizing these events, right, you think of like, okay, well, what are, what is their perception? What are, what is the perception they've heard from other organizers? And then how do you balance that out with like data, what, what you actually know about that place? Um, and I do, I would say that it is a balance between that data and the perception, because you don't want to just rely on saying, oh, we made the decision because we know the data shows this, this, and this about demographics, say it's about demographics or air quality or whatever it is. But then what about the perception of the people who are actually there and actually say, no, it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't actually feel safe. Um, yeah. So yeah, and it's, it's interesting. The one thing about the U.S., like there's things like from like an LGBTQ, like those type of laws, those perspectives is one thing. And another thing that I don't think, I don't know how much it's talked about, but my, for being in Austin, like when you're in the county, like relatively things from that perspective would be okay to visit. The things that I would be more concerned about is um, the gun laws. Um, it is something that I am very aware of when I go back. Um, it is something that statistically is a large problem and is a large problem with events. Um, and so I think the, like that's something that I do think about a lot, even if this is my personal life of when I go of like when I go back, because I do have family there. Um, and so you just have that with different some of these areas to be considering some of people like the the physical safety aspect. Yeah, totally agree. I think that's a really good point. Um, and I think to your point too, Chan, of having uh, a database of data, but also um, firsthand or uh, more personal experience from organizers, uh, I think would also be helpful. And I don't know how we will collect that, but maybe it's a yearly survey, like somebody could collect that. I'm not saying it needs to be us, but somebody could collect um, 
you know, a survey from organizers, like based on their experience, based on the feedback they got from attendees, you know, something like that, that would be super helpful just to have that in aggregate somewhere that could be usable by, by everybody who wants to host an event, I think would be super helpful. I'll just say one final thing um, about the, um, the public health in particular. Um, she said they do consider it, but they don't prioritize it like they did, um, which I guess makes sense. Uh, there is, she said, after COVID, there has been a shift in the in the legal way that their contracts are set up. So it used to be that they would put in that force majeure clause to let them cancel an event based on unpredictable events like hurricanes, fires, whatever. Um, she said the venues are also doing that now. So everybody's just trying to protect themselves, really. So it's really changed kind of the landscape around how they negotiate these large venues. So that is just something that they keep in mind um, when they are, because you know they they're not. She said they will look at things like um, hurricane season. They're they're going to try not to host an event in a hurricane uh, prone place during that time. But um, but again, you know, like everything is so unpredictable, especially when they're having to go so far out. So it's it's a a lot of unknowns. They do the best they can with what they do know and what they can control. And I appreciated again her honesty and just her years of experience. So I feel like if we did do something with the data, she did say they would be more than happy to contribute whatever they could based on what they've collected over the years, which I thought was really awesome. I just love them. They're awesome. Great. I have a quick, I, I have to know what, who is she, like she or the organization like the, was being referred to, right, in this conversation? Oh, oh her name is Angela Brown. I believe her title. Okay is VP of events at the Linux Foundation. Okay, yeah. The one who leads the team who does all of those giant, huge events. So. Yeah, I'd be so interested to hear, or I'll, I'd be curious, I don't even know how this would end up happening in actuality, but ha like hearing from event organizers that live in different regions and that being more of a network, like whenever it comes in, people are like, oh, Hurricanes, if you've never lived in a hurricane region or organized events in a hurricane region, it sounds like this like big mythical, I don't know how to predict versus like, I grew up on an island in the Gulf Coast. And I'm like, yeah, don't organize event in the Gulf Coast between the months of July and mid September, and you're probably fine. Like, and it's it really, and I think there's some of those type of things that if you get a network of local organ people who are used to organizing events in each region, maybe that is a, a way to help with this type of stuff. Yeah, I love that idea. Location. And I, I wonder if the Linux Foundation and maybe even um, ASF, because um, Callie, before you joined, we talked to Brian as well. And I wonder if, if, it's, a, if it's global events, if they had like, I, and I don't know if Linux Foundation has this or not, but like, open and source ambassadors from different parts of the world who can contribute their thoughts on uh, event planning in those locations. I know India has a ton of events happening, um, but they have monsoon season and they have, they have other holidays and things happening. And so I wonder if they have a group of ambassadors who can give them information like that. Any other interviews that we need to talk about? Um, I can summarize mine really quickly, just so we don't stay on this too long. Um, I also met with our internal lead on events, um, who schedules a lot and plans a lot of Google co-located events um, and community meetups. Um, I There are a lot of things that were already said in terms of proximity to the community, proximity to other events, cost, size, health and safety, which also has been diminishing since COVID. Um, one thing that she said that ha hasn't come up yet um, is sort of better information on accessibility um, because in the US ADA requirements like force venues to be upfront about that. Um, that's not always the case in other countries. Um, and so she's, she's struggled to get some accessibility information from venues when actually physically selecting sites in other locations. Um, so she would love better information on that. Um, the Politics and cultural climate piece, I think, came up a lot um, also in this conversation. And just, again, the problem of booking ahead versus what happens when you actually show up. Um, and 
for her, it was really just challenging to keep track of all the little subtleties and political changes and news and changing laws and ordinances. And she's like, wouldn't it be great if I knew that as it was happening? So we knew how to address it because you, you might be already locked into a venue, but like something happens or passes or changes, we need to have a statement, we need to have a plan of action. So there was definitely some interest to have better, more regular updates on what was happening in, in any of these individual occasions. I mean, I think that's a massive amount of information. I'm not really sure, again, how we would uh, even pull that from um, when a state or a country or uh, a regionality changes a policy that impacts a community or some community members. Um, so that was sort of like sort of the confusion of how to find that was one of her bigger data problems. Um, in terms of top five locations, there was also like, there's a, a, a list, um, I think also because often her events are co-located with existing communities or other events, there wasn't as much of a, um, a need to have a major ranking of all the places, um, but they did have one as well. Um, and it was also just, again, being mindful of the community culture inclusivity of that region um, being what was going into those rankings, but also prior Advertising larger cities in general um, that have that usually more diverse and have more options. Um, and it was interesting to me was that the transportation piece wasn't really as much of a consideration, at least for them, just because it was sort of the assumption that people were traveling to these things already. Um, and so it was sort of that was surprising to me. I thought that would be more um, like more of interest. Um, and something that I know we had talked about in, in our calls, but um, it was interesting to hear it come up again with sort of venue specific information. I think the quote that I wrote down is quote unquote, the majority of problems we have is after the contract is signed, uh, which is sort of the like things you don't know if you haven't worked with a vendor before. Um, yeah, life, and, that's life, man. Yeah. Like I, I just remember hearing about, I don't know for the folks that were in KubeCon at Valencia, um, just there was a lot of like difficulty working with that vendor, um, especially because the community was trying to have health and safety forward things, but then they were been like not only regional issues, but also vendor restrictions and like dealing with their local unions and trade organizations. And it was just one of those things where like, because we were trying to be more mindful around community needs and health and safety requirements, it like, I don't want to swear on this call, but it, it was not pretty. Um, and some of those things are like, they didn't know because the venue was already picked, they already had to work with these vendors and then it just like was challenging. Um, so I don't know how much of that again, like is information that could be collected around working with specific types of vendors, um, and, and venues or venue teams. Um, but that was also of interest. Just to add to uh, that. Um, sorry, Sophia, I just wanted to no, jump okay. really quick. Um, Angela also did have a similar sentiment with, especially with things like gender neutral restrooms and being able to like provide that for the folks at the conference. She said some places you will ask that and try to get that and they look at you. She said they look at you with like you have two heads. Like, why would we do like they don't they're not quite there yet. So um, she did mention that that was also very challenging is the restrictions from the venues. Yeah. Kelly has her hand up. Yeah, I just had a question if in any of these conversations, like the topic of like the local transportation comes up, because I know that you in different, especially in the US, you have different portions of it that, I mean, public transportation, like out the wind, like not the norm, but even the, like, within I started just thinking of like, some people can rent cars, yes, but like, are you able to get Ubers and taxis? Like, are you able to get transportation to and from places um if you do not have a vehicle like it's like it's not if you're gonna go to most places in the u.s you're you can't like just be like yes no on public transit but there are some areas where you get there and you're like oh my gosh like i can't get around here if i don't have a vehicle and that seems to be a little that seems to be a pretty big ask for people like, I feel like that from like a inclusivity standpoint. I guess that was just, but like, I was curious if that came up in any of the conversations y'all been having. Yeah, I mean, I asked about it directly and it was yeah. less important than other things. 
Um, but I really? think it's also from her perspective is because event locations were already selected by the other factors, um, not okay. necessarily by transportation. Like in a perfect world, it'd be nice to host things in places like New York, but most events aren't happening there because yeah. it's too expensive and there's no other major like event or community that's there. So then we're not in that location because of other reasons. Oh, yeah. I mean, my bar is at the can you book a a taxi or or Uber? Like, is that available? Because it's just not in Europe a little bit different. But here it's just. Yeah, when I spoke to Brian, it was about there's the kind of base layer fundamental variables that everyone considers, you know, location, dates, all of those things. And then when you start to dig into these other variables like transportation, he spoke about like, if it is low effort and maximum impact, they do it. It's, it just gets added. And so that's kind of how he has viewed um, like adding these extra, I don't know, I wouldn't say extra, but adding these other variables in uh, to consider because there, there's just so many things to consider. Mm -hmm. okay um anything else quick on that before we move on to the other agenda items yeah, i don't think so okay um i have done uh <clears throat> excuse me i've done a fair bit of work looking at the relicensing and forks um, specifically just around the organizational diversity of the contributors, because that's the piece that I needed to, to get separately from, um, from GitHub. So I've been, I've been digging into that. And so I, I'm looking, I've, I've proposed some research, uh, stuff and some, uh, conference talks around kind of four case studies. So Elasticsearch with open search. So kind of Two, two in one case study, the relicense and the fork. And then Redis and, and Valky are the ones that I've I've looked at. So um, you know, Elasticsearch on so oh um caveat that I will give is that um the analysis of all of these are just a single repository, um, like the primary repository. And the caveat is that it's just a summary of data and I haven't talked to people from the community to validate it. So some of this data may just be wrong. Um, but I will I will talk to people to validate it, but this is this is where I am right now. Um, unsurprisingly, for anybody who knows anything about Elastic and Elasticsearch, it has always been dominated by um, contributions from employees. So basically, Elastic employees make up the vast majority of of contributions. So when they relicensed, there was effectively no um, little to no impact on the contributor community. Uh, because frankly, they didn't have one. So the impact was was entirely on the user base for, for Elasticsearch. And then what happened when they relicensed is that they um, the OpenSearch fork was created. And it's important to note that OpenSearch is an Amazon AWS project. And it was it was forked from Elasticsearch, and this is, you know, was forked reasonably, uh, you know, long time, not long time ago, but several years. Um, and so Amazon AWS have been the dominant contributors to open search. Um, so it's not surprising given it's that it's their project. Um, but the organizational diversity has been gradually improving and they've done some stuff in the governance that has facilitated this. And I'm going to talk to Chris uh, Friedane, who's their community manager. He's already said he'd talk to me about this. Um, but if you look at the first year of the fork, they, Amazon made 80% um, of the additions and 90% of the deletions. So that's kind of what I'm using to measure the, like the impact of the contributions um, with only three external people making more than five commits. So they didn't have much that first year. Um, but in the past year, um, they've made 64% of the additions and 67% of the deletions. And they had 10 people who made more than five commits. Um, however, a lot of the additions and deletions are kind of due to one individual from from Ivan who made a bunch of the a bunch of the um, changes. Um, but they, you know, they do have some some organizational diversity. They've got people from let's see, uh, yeah, so they have several people from from Ivan 
um, somebody from Google. So they've, you know, they've got a reasonable number of <clears throat> non Amazon contributions. So I think it's it's definitely definitely improving, but it is still an Amazon project. Any questions on that one before I talk about Redis and Valky? So the reason I picked these two examples is because they are very different. Um, so Redis, um, the Redis project is owned by the company Redis, so it's a company-owned project, and um, the majority of contributions have always kind of been from Redis employees but they used to get um, a lot more contributions from other people outside of the company. Um, but, uh, so, so here are some examples of people that contributed to Redis before the relicense. And then all of these people have transitioned away from the Valky fork and um, three of them have become kind of the top contributors to Valky. So, so the Valky fork was more of a community fork. So it was people who were already contributing to Redis who then took the, the code and forked it and, and created, created Valky. And so then if you look at Valky, it's a Linux foundation project. So it's very different from, from open search. Um, and there's a pretty diverse set of contributors from a variety of companies. So Amazon and Google are those employees are making kind of the most significant contributions. And unsurprisingly, given that it was a hostile fork, nobody from Redis came over. But you can see here are, and it's it's a relatively new fork. So this is data from um, basically from April till um, beginning of August-ish or middle, middle of August. And so you can kind of see, you know, there are 11 people from Amazon. They're making a lot of contributions. There are two people from Google who are doing a lot of the, a lot of the work. Um, and then there's also, you know, somebody from, this is one person from Ericsson, a couple of people from ByteDance and Huawei who are also making a lot of, a lot of contributions. So it's interesting to see the difference between Elasticsearch and Redis and the difference between OpenSearch and Valky, um, just given uh, kind of the differences in those, in those projects. So that, that's where I am right now. I'll probably, right now, all of this data is um, private on, on, GitHub. I will, I'll probably clean it up and maybe start talking to some of the people in these communities. And then I'll eventually publish um, these notebooks on the data science working group repository under the chaos project so that people can have a look at them in more detail. Any questions? Sean, there's a, a request for you to mute because we can hear you typing. Really? The... Oh, That's yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Don, I have one question for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, was there anything that you discovered from this data that was surprising to you? Or did this kind of just back up the hunch you already had about how, or did you have any hunches? Um, this, this did tend to back up the hunches that I already had. Um, but to be fair, I'd also spent a fair bit of time looking at Elasticsearch and OpenSearch before before, because um, when I worked at VMware, them relicensing created quite a quite an impact, and so I tried to get involved involved in open search a little bit, and they were not particularly friendly to outside contributors at the time. Um, things have changed drastically within that project, but um, but yeah, so I spent a lot of time in that in that. Um, kind of in that space looking at it. So I had a pretty good feel for what that was going to look like um, just based on, on knowledge that I had. Um, to be honest, I didn't I didn't really know all that much about Redis and Valky other than what I'd seen in you know presentations at you know Linux Foundation events and some some articles that I'd read about about what happened um, there. I guess I was maybe maybe the one thing I was a little bit surprised about was that the um, to the extent that the Redis employees dominated the Redis project, um, because I knew that there were a lot of outside contributors. I didn't realize, like, um, you know, there. So if you look at it, like, um, sorry, let me just, that was after the relicense. So if you look at a year, one year before the relicense, like, seven, you know, almost basically 80% of the additions were made by Redis employees, uh, along with, you know, 74% of the deletions. And I guess I thought that these numbers would have been a little bit higher than other people from other companies. 
And these would have been maybe a little bit lower. I thought it was, I thought it would be a little bit more balanced than it was based on just things I'd, I'd heard. So when you, you said you are going to try to talk to some of these folks who have been involved in, mm -hmm. contributing. Um, is your, is your end goal to provide advice? maybe around license changes for companies like okay if you do this thing that you want to do here are the risks you you um, may encounter or you may see and also here is maybe some ways to get around that or some things to be mindful of or i guess i'm just curious like what do you think the end deliverable is going to be here yeah um yeah, you know, I think the the end deliverable is more informational than um, prescriptive. So it's I I don't sure. intend to talk to people who are planning to relicense and give them advice about what to do, because ultimately most of these relicenses, relicensing events have happened because their investors, their shareholders, their stakeholders said you need to make a profit and and here's here's something that you can do to do that. And there's like me telling them what the impact of that is. I I don't know I don't know how much they how much they care. Um, I do think that a side effect of this will be that hopefully people who are selecting projects to use will think more about the possibility of these relicensing events and what can happen as a result. I mean, and I also hope that companies will think about the impact that this has. Um, you know, so like the Redis example, when you when you relicense it, you you probably should expect to lose most of your external contributors to a fork or some other some other thing. So I think just helping people understand the, the expectations, both from a consumption side and from a project side. Um, Sophia, you have your hand up. Whoops, and you're on mute. You already answered my first question, so I'll, I'll go to the one that's a, a more nebulous one. Um, you had a really interesting comment are on your personal experience of a new project, not necessarily like it could be neutrally governed, but not really open to outsiders necessarily. Like they were still kind of insular even when it started. Um, mm -hmm. And this might be difficult to do in the scope of analysis, but I'd be curious around what we could learn from either contributing or readme guides or around the governance structure of these projects that make them also more or less open to outside contribution, like knowing, I guess in the last search example, it was predominantly employees that were doing this work, but was that because they set it up that way or because they weren't welcoming to others? Like, I think there there are multiple, like other reasons why projects can be either more or less welcoming to external contribution. Like I think of it within the example of Google, when we consult with projects that are about to be released to the wild. The governance model is clearly a popular topic of conversation. You know, April Nassie, that's her jam. Um, and it's it's mostly like, how? what is your end state here? If you want this to be a project that has multiple parties working on it, you need to write in mechanisms to do that upfront. Like I, I always like the Istio example, which was released as a Google project, but from the beginning, other affiliations could become part of the leadership group by their level of contribution. Like it was set up to allow for multiple representatives from other companies to be in the leadership of the project. And that was before it was ever donated to the CNCF. That was just the structure of the governance model where that is not the other case with other Google projects. We don't have to do it with all of them because they have different goals. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious how you could incorporate that into this in terms of like, it's, it's a, tricky and subjective thing, but it also potentially is impactful in, in the data. You could see that in data. Maybe that'll come through in conversations versus yeah. like you trying to dig up historical documentation, which just sounds like a boondog. <laughs> yeah, that's a really, it's a really good question. Um, in the case of open search, they, they were um, specifically hostile about documenting the governance. They just kept saying it's, it's open, you contribute, that's how you earn your your rights to do things, um, but they wouldn't document any of their governance processes. Um, so there just was, there were no governance documents um, to even to even look at. They were just like, no, no, contribute. And then that's how you earn it. I'm like, yeah, but you don't document, <laughs> document that anywhere. So sorry, I'm not gonna just believe you. Um, and then they would say things like, oh, well, you know, that was decided in a, in a meeting. I'm like, oh, what meeting? Oh, a private Amazon meeting. 
Um, and so there were just all these like weird, weird conversations. Um, but I'm gonna call it Cali because I like Cali's idea of of looking at it. I do think that's probably one way to get to get at this. Yeah, it's probably one of the most substantial things I've learned in the last year of the degree. Like you're usually looking at like hundreds to thousands to like you're looking at like 50, 100, 200. Like that's the degree of open PRs versus PRs being merged for some if you're looking at like a larger open source project. And so looking to see, okay, is the people, how many people are opening? Cause like commits are going to be, you're going to, this would probably be represented in like the commit data that you're looking at. Cause that's going to be the stuff that's actually getting um, approved. And so that's something that's been interesting, but I kind of, it's like, what are the impacts of this? I think that there's like more on the user or just the, like as a contributor, as a user of what you're going to depend on, I hope that we can kind of take this to be more of an informational, like I don't, I'm trying to figure out how to verbalize it, but when people are making decisions around what projects to get involved in or the projects that they're going to use, that looking at what company or if it's a part of a foundation or these are trying to consider these types of things, maybe how to bring that more into the forefront of people's considerations of like, this is the risk of whenever a singular company like is holding the keys to the, like, to the like open source community. And it's interesting to me that you talk about the Istios example, because Istios was actually probably the first project that I was doing substantial analysis on during the, like, cause I, the fake, I came into Red Hat while it was still a, like, like owned by Google and trying to get it moved over to, to a foundation. And there was a lot of just like people within Red Hat are like, I want you to look into this because they were concerned about what was the acceptance of outside contributions. How, how open was it really um, was a major part of the conversations to try to get it pushed into a foundation. Um, yeah, I was doing some Istio analysis back then uh, for the same yeah. same reasons at, at VMware. We had some of the same same concerns, and I was looking. I was looking not at the PRs. I was looking at leadership positions. So I was parsing mm -hmm. YAML files and looking at who who had uh, owners' rights and and um, yeah. who, uh, like you know working group leadership and and stuff like that. Uh, began. Who has permissions to review? Like that's because it's like we're is on that's on the flip side of things getting merged, who's, who has the permissions to review the code to be able to merge it. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have five minutes left. So there are a couple of a couple of things on the agenda that we can talk about. Um, but we probably have to, to pick one. Uh, I don't know, do you have anything new around the Project Exodus, Kelly, or anything you want to talk about on that one? Not really, I'm trying to figure out if like, really what you're working on in this, how different they really, because they are yours, like the license changes is like a subset of people leaving the project. And I kind of, I really like what you just did with more like in-depth case examples. And I'm thinking, I'm still going to try to do a call out of getting more examples. Cause I think that it's just good from like a data science working group, exam like, like a data science working group, like having these case examples, this is something that, I've asked for like as coming into open source a couple of years ago of like needing case examples is the was one of the most important things when trying to do analysis. So I might try to take two and do something similar to what you've done of doing like some more case analysis. And I might try to switch this Exodus project to more being like, how do we gather examples of of certain open source phenomenon so we can have this in our toolkit to be able to do different forms of analysis, like as things come up that we can say, oh, this is happening. When has this happened before? Can we look into this? Mm -hmm. So I think I want to do a bit of a pivot on it. Okay. Okay. Um... We have three minutes. I don't know, Sophia, if you wanted to talk at all about the research and publication thing. Do that I even know mine. what this was? That was that was <laughs> mine actually. Oh, sorry. That, that oh, was, Sean Goggins, of course. I was like, I was like, yeah, okay, sorry. So, Sophia, what's Sophia? <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah. 
Um, I'm curious, yeah, I think though. We can, we can save that for next time. It's more than a three-minute <laughs> conversation, so. Okay. I might, I might have something for the three minutes just because I came in a little bit late, and I wanted to yeah. ask, I don't know who the security uh, practitioner guide. Yes. Um, I have just now started to get, build a relationship with our security team with NET, who has a lot more open source knowledge than I was really anticipating. And I think they would be a really good resource to like, I'm already starting to talk to them about like, okay, making like figuring out how to use their knowledge for this type of stuff. Cause they have a large interest in doing metrics and visualizations around the security of open source. And so when I saw this, I was like, oh my gosh, I have people that would be able to give feedback. I just don't know how exactly to point them towards this. Yeah, I would love that. So these these documents are all open. Um, so I would say feel free to pass that on um, to people who might want to provide feedback. I've, I've also given it to um, at least one person who's completely outside the chaos community, but knows a lot about security, hoping to get some of their feedback. Um, so I would just preface it with, this is really designed for people who don't know what they're doing and are just getting started. Um, so yeah. it's not gonna be comprehensive, but if they know, yeah. especially if they have some good resources that we can link to, that's one of the things that this is really light on because it's it's very open SSF heavy because that's what I'm familiar with. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that they have loads of other like resources we could link to. Maybe there's some Red Hat documents that are public that you use or some other security organizations that I'm just not as familiar with. So yeah, I would say I would I would encourage you to send it to additional people who might want to provide some feedback. That'd be great. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So I, I put kind of notes about some of the caveats. Like we're not going to add more metrics, and we have to use the <laughs> chaos metrics. Um, yeah. Yeah. So so there are a few notes at the top to try to guide people guide people in because it's not not everything. Um. Okay, and then the one other thing, just as a reminder, if you have stuff that you want to share with the community, you can go to the general channel. There's a um, a comms uh, uh, pin post or bookmark something that's a little form that you can fill out. LF Member Summit deadline is in three days, so if you wanted to submit something there, now's your now's your chance. And if you have ideas for cool podcasts, uh, we have an email address for those as well. Or, um, I think for the pot, I, I don't know what, like, I don't have enough content on it yet, but I do think that an S bomb, like what is the impact of like the need for S bomb analysis on open source communities and metrics? I think it's going to be an interesting conversation. I don't necessarily know who should be in that conversation, but I, or it's even might be a little early, but I think that's like one of the biggest tides that's going to impact our community in the next like year or two. No, for sure. That's that's something that um, that uh, keeps coming up. Uh, not and just it will in the chaos world, but but everywhere. Everybody's talking about the the s bombs. And I was just talking to a company, and they're they're struggling to um, struggling to figure out just how to get the s bombs, like how to um, how to find them, how to how to you know, when you're looking, especially if you're looking at like package managers, where where might the S bomb be in, across ten different package managers, and how do you find this stuff? So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting challenge um, around the data. So yeah, that would be great. I would say if you could send that to that the podcast. Yeah, thing, let me. That'd be awesome. All right, so we are we are now officially over time. So. Thank you all for coming um, at our new Tuesday edition. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll probably see most of you in just a couple of minutes at the weekly chaos meeting. Sounds good. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.